to Robert Davis. I'm chair of the Road Danger Reduction Forum. Uh, this is episode two of our Reducing Road Danger in Powering Local Communities webinar series, which replaces our conference due to be held in April. Um, we're shortly going to be get a, uh, a welcome from the RDRF president, Baroness Jenny Jones. Uh, we will be then having our uh, three speakers. Jeremy Leach will be talking about community speed watch and associated matters to do with reducing speed. Uh, Claire from London Cycling, Claire Rogers from London Cycling Campaign will be talking about what she's been involved with um, in terms of engaging local communities to get low traffic neighbourhoods in. And then Victoria Lebrecht from Road Peace will be talking about um, getting the police and crime commissioners on board. We uh, had, <coughs> <coughs> oh, excuse me, very successful uh, webinar last Thursday and um, that was recorded that is now on the Road Danger Reduction Forum website. Um, this will be on the RDRF website and also the Road Peace website along with responses to questions to the panelists um, and Please, uh, I know there will be a lot of questions. Can you put them down in the Q&A column, not the chat column, because it makes it a bit more difficult for us to fill it them out. Um, so uh, without further ado, uh, let me pass you on to Baroness Jones, who apart from being our president, was very involved in opposing road danger reduction in her road role as a member of the London Assembly some years ago. Over to Jenny. You're muted, Jenny. Muted. Well, I can only say at the House of Lords they unmute us. We don't have to do anything. Um, uh, as Bob said, I uh, am, I sit in the House of Lords. My name's Jenny Jones. But before I was in the House of Lords, I was a London Assembly member, and as such, I met and worked with these troublemakers, Bob Davis and Jeremy Leach. And I've got to say, it was a pleasure to have such a meeting of minds about the fact that our roads have to be safe. And at the time I was talking a lot about road safety. I don't talk about road safety anymore because that's the solution to all our problems. And actually the problem that we're dealing with is road danger. And so Road Danger Reduction Forum is so well, um, so well um, expressed. I think it's uh, something we should all care about, particularly when we live in such built up areas. And today you're actually going to hear a lot of really practical common sense stuff that you can do. And I particularly like the, um, well, Jeremy is going to be fascinating about reducing speeds, which of course is crucial. It's crucial not only for our neighborhoods, but also and, and our safety, but it's also crucial for perhaps reducing the number of cars that use our roads and so improving our air, uh, our air pollution and perhaps even uh, doing a little bit towards saving our planet. And of course, um, Claire, um, is, uh, Claire Rogers is going to do this thing about um, actually, uh, you know, talking to your, involving your police and crime commissioner, which is absolutely crucial because the police and crime commissioner, although they don't actually um, control the police, they can, in fact, with uh, they can, in fact, encourage areas of funding. And so, thank you very much to Bob for inviting me. I've got an unstable Wi-Fi connection still, so if I drop out, it's not because I'm not fascinated by everything you're saying. Thanks very much. Thanks, Jenny. Um, also, just a quick thanks to the people who've sponsored this, uh, more Barlow solicitors. Also, last week in our third party reporting, we had um, uh, input from uh, Next Base, the dash cam people, and Madison who, with their cycle camera lights. Uh, thanks to those three sponsors, uh, without which uh, this would not have been so easy to do. Thank you. Okay, so let's go on to Jeremy. Um, tell us a bit about yourself and what you do, Jeremy. 
Thanks ever so much, Bob. Is, is, the, um, is the presentation visible? I hope so. It is indeed. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks ever so much. My name is Jeremy Leach from, and I've got a number of hats. One is as chair of London Living Streets, also as some um, uh, here as the chair, of, as a founder of the Action Visions era, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Thank you so much for inviting us. I'm really looking forward to this. So what we're going to be looking at is re reducing speeds in your neighbourhood, um, 20 mile an hour speed limits, intelligent speed assistance and community speed, community road watch. And ooh, this is why it doesn't click through. And now it does, great. So I'm gonna give a tiny bit of background about Vision Zero, the significance of speed as Jenny's already alluded to, and then 20 mile an hour speed limits, ISA and Community Roadwatch. So what's the, what's the background around Vision Zero? So um, overall, it, it aims for a target of no serious or fatal road casualties in the long term, deeming them avoidable and, this, and road casualties as unacceptable. It has its origins in Sweden in the 1990s and takes its cues from very successful attempts to reduce some danger in relation to transportation around railways and um, air travel. Although we're called Vision Zero, Action Vision Zero, our emphasis is very much around road danger reduction. So it's, it's reducing danger at source, but also very much creating the environment in which more people can walk and cycle and be active. That's an absolute fundamental. In terms of Vision Zero, a, number of, a, a large number of countries and um, places have talked about this, particularly in, the, in America, in the US. Um, and lots of cities have sort of developed sort of 30 page plans of which 29 pages of why it's a good idea. And then there's basically half a page of action plan because that's where it gets really difficult. Um, in the UK, London's very much set the pace here. The mayor's transport strategy from 2016 embraced the idea of a target of no fatal or serious casualties on the roads. And the target is that by 2041, that will be the case. There are also encouragingly a number of interim targets which TfL are very much aiming to, to, to meet. As well as London now, this is gaining traction. Other metropolitan authorities, I think we've got representatives of places like Liverpool here and also and places like Manchester, Birmingham. So there are metropolitan authorities really starting to think about this. And really encouragingly, Scotland has just produced, um, just published a new framework for road for um, road danger reduction with a, an initial 2050, no one will be killed or injured on Scotland's roads. And I think overall why this is gaining momentum is it's an attempt to address the lack of focus on reducing road casualties by the UK government since 2010 and the removal of targets by the coalition government when it came in 2010. And this is very much this is very much local authorities and highway authorities starting to try and fill this very significant vacuum. Action Vision Zero is campaigning very much around road danger. These are our main headings, slower speeds, safe junctions and crossings for people on foot, safe cycling, safe space for cycling, in particular protected cycle lanes on main roads. And then as Claire's gonna talk about two low traffic neighborhoods, which are a fundamental building block of that. As Jenny alluded to the whole issue of less traffic, safe vehicles and then safe behaviours and, and enforcement. What we're going to talk about principally here today is issues around slower speeds and how communities can start to take, take, um, take the agenda and make things happen, you know, even if that's not happening from other authorities. The significance of speed. Speed is a factor in around a third of serious and fatal collisions. This this comes from two principal sources. First of all, around the Transport for London Vision Zero Action Plan, which cited that speeds are factoring up to more than two thirds of collisions resulting in death or serious injury on London's roads. And a very recent statistic from the German, Fed, the German Federal Statistic Office looking at the 2019 road casualties in Germany, just under a third, 32% of people who were killed in traffic collision in 2019 in Germany died in an incident where the police accused one driver of driving at inappropriate speed. So this is very, very significant. If speed can be addressed, there's an opportunity to really start to reduce the number of people killed and seriously injured on our roads. And speed's a major factor in the severity of pedestrian injuries. Here we look at the speed of vehicle um, at the time of a, um, collision with a pedestrian, if the vehicle is traveling at 30 kilometers hour, just under 20 miles an hour, there's a 5% um, likelihood that the pedestrian will be killed at 
um, 30 miles an hour, that rises to over half, and that's uh, at nearly 40 miles an hour, that's around 90%. So the speed of vehicles is very, very significant in relation to pedestrian um, injuries. So 20 mile an hour speed limits. Why, why is 20 mile an hour an issue? Why do we aim to set 20 mile an hour speed limits? Well, for me, the, the, this first um, graphic is for me what kind of got me excited about all this in the first place. So this was a study done by the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine into the impact of all those, there were about 300 or so 20 mile an hour zones. These were traffic calm zones. These are ones where neighborhoods were calmed through um, traffic calming such as um, um, full width humps and maybe the occasional sort of removal of through traffic in a whole period from 1986 to 2006. So the study was done in 2009, looking at a huge amount of data over a 20 year period. And what it found was in those areas, compared with the areas not covered by the, the um, traffic calming, there'd been a 42% decline in casualties. And that was over and above the background decline that was occurring that time in casualties. So where we can genuinely get maximum speeds down to around 20 miles an hour in an urban or a built up setting, we've got the chance to reduce casualties by around two fifths, which is a huge, huge saving and way above anything that's being achieved in the last, um, last decade or so. Another indicator is, and you know, this is probably not very well known, but in the 40 foot distance, it takes a vehicle traveling at 20 miles an hour to stop a 30 mile an hour vehicle is still doing 27 miles an hour. So you know, huge impact on stopping distances depending on that maximum speed. Lower emissions, an Imperial College study for the City of London found that at worst, there's a neutral impact of emissions at driving at lower speed, lower maximum speeds. And obviously the issue is around acceleration. In urban traffic, permanently stopping and starting, accelerating to 30 miles an hour, requires two and a quarter times the energy to accelerate 20 miles an hour. There are benefits in reduced noise, and then also studies have found around 20 miles an hour in the past, it enables walking and cycling, and obviously there are public health benefits there. It also improves community reaction, and that's been particularly significant around the COVID pandemic, where people have been out and about more. Fast traffic causes significant severance, so again, Communities can feel more comfortable and safe and wanting to interact if speeds are reduced. Here's some examples of sort of 20 mile an hour across the country. The good thing is, you probably, again, sort of, you know, this may get lost in the conversation about speeds. 20 mile an hour in residential streets remains and has remained very popular throughout the last 15 years or so. So typically, three quarters of um, adults support 20 mile an hour speed limits as against around a tenth who are against them. So where are we at now? So thanks to community campaigning spearheaded by 20's Plenty for Us and obviously other organisations like Living Street, Sustrans and London Cycling Campaign, many, many other groups, but 20 mile an hour speed limits are moving to the mainstream. And here we look at the, this is the, almost the last thing that happened before um, um, the, the pandemic and the lockdown. Ministers met in Stockholm to this, at the third global ministerial road safety conference and as part of their resolution at the end of the conference, number 11, was that they mandated a maximum road travel speed of 30 kilometers an hour, 20, 18 miles an hour, in areas where vulnerable road users and vehicles mix in a frequent and planned manner. So that really does set the tone for, um, you know, for worldwide, the urban built up speed limit in time becoming 30 kilometers an hour, 18 miles an hour. And you know, that resolution was then adopted in late August by the United Nations General Assembly. So this is, this is not, this is something that's absolutely mainstream now. Across the UK, out of the, I don't know, 65 million people that live in the UK now, around 21 million people currently live in 20 mile an hour authorities. You can see there's some images of there, but right across the country, all of those authorities have basically moved to a default speed limit of 20 miles an hour. This is the latest speed limit map in London. So the 20 mile an hour streets and roads are shown in green. As you can see, Inner London and large swathes of outer London now are, have a 20 mile an hour speed limit. Really encouragingly, Westminster, which was a sort of hole in the donut before, has just turned all its streets 20 miles an hour. The Royal Borough of Kensington, Chelsea, the one in the box, will be 20 mile an hour by February next year. So it's a real strong movement towards London becoming a 20 mile an hour city. 
Very encouragingly, in May 2019, the First Minister of Wales announced a national 20 mile an hour default for the Principality. There's been a lot of work done by committees and the Principality administration since then, and it's now been recently confirmed that this is scheduled to be delivered by 2023. Wales will become the first country in the world to have a 20 mile an hour default speed limit. In the whole time I've campaigned, there's been a lot of questions about 20 mile an hour speed limits around emissions, um, do they work, what's the value of them, but the greatest criticism in the last couple of years is around the, the, the need for greater enforcement. If people introduce it, what will be the impact? And the next issue I think starts to speak to that. So we're going to look at intelligent speed assistance now. So this is a, a graph of road deaths in Europe, um, which totaled nearly just under 23,000 in 2019. As you see, the blue line there was the target that the EU had between 2011 and 2020. Up to 2013, there were significant declines occurring, but ever since that time, um, there's been a, a, a stall in the reduction in road deaths. So um, the, the gap from that target led the EU to update its general safety requirements for new vehicles. So new vehicles now need to address to include autonomous emergency braking, which can detect pedestrians and cyclists, overridable intelligent speed assistance, and also being fitted with electronic data recorders to look at issues such as speed when there's a collision. The European Sa Transport Safety Council estimated that if implemented correctly, ISA could eventually reduce road deaths by 20%. And the, re the, the change to the regulations now requires ISA systems to be required on all new cars, vans, lorries and buses sold in the EU from 2022. And the good news is that even though the UK is not in the EU anymore, the, it will also embrace these regulations and these will be required on new UK vehicles too. Please note that this does not include power two, vehicle, two, um, power two, wheel, two wheelers. How does it work? GPS or signals identify the speed limit. The car then takes that information and in, you know, ideally um, it then manually or automatically then affects the maximum speed limit. However, in overridable um, ISA, the driver can override the system by pressing hard on the accelerator. Interestingly, Transport for London looked at this technology about from about 2015 and, and did a trial very early on in the process. So, and Transport for London requires mandatory, so not overridable, but mandatory ISA on all new TfL buses and um, has done so since 2018. And of, as of March 2019, 700 new buses which have come in the last year out of the 9,000 fleet have been fitted with ISA. And the really encouraging data, again, learned this is mandatory ISA. In, in research into the trial that they undertook in 2015, TfL that buses fitted with the ISA was staying within the speed limit from 97 to 99% of the time. So this, is, this, has got to, this has got the potential to be an enormously powerful tool in terms of addressing speed in our, in our built up areas. There is a slight fly in the ointment, which is the ETSI who we described earlier and a coalition of organizations have now written to EU member states raising serious concerns about the way the regulations and the politicians had um, implemented, had drafted the legislation, how that's going to be delivered technically um, in terms of ISA. And they've got real concerns about the possibilities of manufacturers installing systems that only alert drivers when they break the speed limit rather than assist them to remain within it. The risks of fitting systems that are not accurate enough and then the issue of systems that can be de deactivated too easily. It looks like the manufacturers are keen to encourage relatively easily deactivatable systems. And obviously that's way against the spirit of the legislation. So I think, you know, as against that problem, I'd sort of said as a campaigner around 20 miles an hour, around how are you going to enforce this? What's interesting with ISA, you move from the issue of enforcement to one of compliance. And I think that's a massive change whereby vehicles will naturally comply with the speed limit rather than it's up to someone else externally to enforce it. So finally, let's have a look at community road and speed watch, which a bit like the campaign that happened around 20 mile an hour speed limits is really exciting because it's very much something that communities can lobby for and make happen. And it's something that everybody in a neighborhood and in the community can, can, can seek to, to do. So here's, I mean, the idea is very simple. It's members of the community working with the police, 
typically um, PCSOs, um, to look at speed speeds on, on streets that are of concern in the areas where they live. So I just want to sort of run through the key issue here, because I think there's, a, there's something interesting emerging um, in here as well. A key issue is, of course, the concerns of local communities about speed. And this is something that's been terribly sort of under, undervalued in a way, the feedback that communities have given to um, highway authorities, PCCs, police and crime commissioners, and councillors. It's been, it's been raised as concern a great deal, but there's been a lack of all response from the authorities in relation to it. And obviously that's been exacerbated over the last decade by cuts to significant cuts to roads policing. And I think what that's encouraged is the community involvement in speed enforcement that we're going to look at now with speed watch and road watch. But also there's a really interesting agenda. And this is this is finally, I think, being picked up by the police or police authorities, in particular by Alison Hernandez in Devon and Cornwall, and obviously by the Metropolitan Police and Bob mentioned Detective Sergeant Andy Cox, that the police and the police no authorities are starting to encourage communities to be engaged in in setting priorities and this is a really important thing that it's there's a chance to engage and become part of a conversation that typically before people were cut out of so this is the main website of community speed watch across the uk communityspeedwatch.org members of local communities join with the police to monitor speeds those that are exceed, exceeding the speed limit are then um are then educated through through letters and in the past year it cited that more than 60,000 speed offense speeding offense records were handled automatically by the process and passed on to local police and 40,000 warning letters were sent as a result in london it's slightly different it's known as community road watch rather than speed watch and here we look at vehicles for a vehicle where the speed limit's 20 miles an hour we look at vehicles being driven at 25 miles an hour and over, they're detected, a letter is sent to the registered owner. Sites, encouragingly, sites with high numbers of speeding driving are then re-looked at by um, police officer enforcement are prioritised for um, more significant enforcement. And there's been an explosion in this, thanks to investment by both the Metropolitan Police and Transport for London and huge community buy-in by people across London by, at a borough level. Community road watch has risen from 3,000 to in 2015-16 to over 35,000 letters that are going out in 18-19. So there's real desire for the MPS, the TFL to engage with local communities in this way. And sometimes, you know, there's information put out in newsletters and brought together to give a bit more background and, inf and useful information to it. And there's a slight twist on this. I don't know if you know about this, but this is called Junior Road Watch and Kids Court. So this is typically officers will stand outside schools with local children, see what speeds are being done, where a driver is exceeding the speed to a significant degree. The driver of the vehicle is given a choice. Would you like a, a fixed penalty notice or would you like to children about to talk to the children about your behaviour? And there's a link there to some sort of articles about this. But what I would say is it can be an extremely harrowing experience for the drivers that choose to speak to the children where they do come face to face with the impact of um, that driving can have on on the children, the safety of children in those schools. So a really interesting approach to use. So that's kind of it. Those are some themes. That's what we've been looking at. Some really good contacts. I would say if you are interested in 20 miles an hour, 20 is plenty, do an amazing job to support local campaigns. They've currently got 480 local campaigns that um, that they support. There's some links there for Community Speed Watch, Community Road Watch, and obviously if you'd ever want any support from Action Vision Zero, we're just only too, light, too delighted to help. Thank you so much for, your, for listening. Bob, you're on um, mute. Oh, hi. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. yes Thanks yes. very much, Jeremy. <laughs> um, we've got a load of questions and we've now got 90 people taking part. Um, if I can just answer a couple of them. Penelope Lawton asked about uh, the um, where we can see the recording of uh, last week's presentations. They, uh, you have the link and information on the RDRF website. I put that in the chat column. It's rdrf.org.uk. Um, 
Ruth Mayorkas talked about the Netherlands having a default 20 mile an hour limit. So I think it's not just Wales. Um, that's one for Jeremy. Um, also, uh, if I can answer a couple of things, um, just Lee said that there's this constant problem that we've ha always had uh, that you have to get uh, go over a threshold of the number of KSIs that's killed and seriously injured uh, casualties in order to get um, the highway authority to take measures. Um, that's bedeviled us for ages. We've been trying to measure danger in different ways from just working back from actual casualties. Don't forget, a lot of people aren't killed by, in this case, speeding vehicles because they're too scared to go out there or their parents are too scared to let them go out there. So we do want to have different criteria for installing the necessary measures. That's something we need to work on. Unfortunately, highway authorities tend to do this, but they don't have to as such. Um, now, a uh, couple of other points. Uh, there were questions about why aren't motorcycles going to be brought under things like uh, ISAs. Um, we do have a concern about motorcyclists being much more likely to be involved in serious and fatal uh, incidents with pedestrians in particular, certainly in London. So it would be good uh, to have those kind of automatic restrictions on motorcycles and mopeds. Um, don't forget, it's all about kinetic energy dispersed on impact. Motorcycles and their riders are heavier than bicycles and go a lot faster. Um, David Davis of the Parliamentary Advisory Council for Transport Safety has said, we are pretty sure, unfortunately, that ISA and other regs will not imply, apply in the UK unless incorporated into UK law. A battle still to be fought. So there's that. Um, now, uh, can, if we can just go on now to some questions which uh, I'd like Jeremy to answer. Um, uh, uh, David Dansky says there have been many areas in London where speed is 20 mile an hour for some years now. Has TfL released data indicating reduced killed and seriously injured in, in these areas? Jeremy. Yeah, I, David, thanks ever so much for that. I'm, um, I'm not aware of that analysis. That's a really good point to take up and look at. Yeah. Uh, can, I, can I just go back to Ruth's point as well? I think, Ruth, great, great knowledge and stuff. We'll have a look at that. I think you've been following that up in the chat. So thank you very much for that update on Holland. Um, and uh, what I would say about 20 mile an hour in London is that Detective Chief Superintendent Cox, as he is now, uh, was um, superintendent in London when he worked in uh, Roads and Traffic uh, Police Command. Uh, 20 mile an hour has been policed in London. Uh, so we've always had over the last 10, 15 years, this constant debate between having 20 mile an hour zones where you have heavy engineering traffic calming and so on to uh, push drivers into driving slower. Uh, and you've got areas where the speed limit is put up, but uh, there may be no enforcement. If there's no enforcement, you tend to get a lot of breaking of the 20 mile an hour limit, um, but it has been enforced in London. I don't know, do you want to say anything more about that, Jeremy? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's a really good point, Bob. I mean, I, I would say that in all of the authorities that went, um, that chose to, all of the early authorities that chose to go to have a default 20 mile an hour speed limit, all of them did in the research, they did find a significant, well, a reduction of between one and two miles an hour in average speeds. And obviously, as Bob said earlier, it's all about kinetic energy. And even that on its own is significant. I think what's, I think what's really encouraging though is, and, and again, one, I think we owe a significant debt to Andy Cox with the way he he handled that um, portfolio when he had it. But he absolutely insisted that as well as the arterial roads, there was going to be significant policing of the 20 mile an hour and 30 mile an hour roads. And that's absolutely what happened. And I don't know if you ever followed his tweets, but he would always make a point to say to itemize the, you know, the number of offences at 20 mile an hour and 30 mile an hour that had been addressed. 
um, as very much as part of the overall picture. The other thing is that obviously speed cameras now um, are now calibrated in relation to what the default speed limit is in the borough. And so, you know, where you have speed cameras in the much greater number of boroughs with 20 miles of speed limits, they are set at 20 miles an hour. So um, no, nobody ever promises a silver bullet with this, but it's a process. And obviously, as David, David's just mentioned, David Davis just mentioned, you know, it's really important that we do manage to take this ISA, um, you know, into UK regulations in the longer term, because that compliance thing is going to be what, what delivers these maximum, lower maximum speeds of vehicles. Thank you, Bob. Uh, yeah, thanks, Jeremy. A couple more. Um, uh, do PCSOs now have the powers to raise tickets on speeding drivers? Okay. Do they? Well, yeah, very good question. I, we do have the expert of this on this meeting, which is Aylid Murray. So Aylid fantastically led a led a campaign in relation to this. I mean, I think I think the um, Met Police they have decided that yes, PCSOs can. Um, prosecute moving, moving traffic offences. But at the same time, I think there's a, that, that has been adopted. I think the problem is now there needs to be a training process for them to go through. And I, my, my understanding was the COVID, pro, the COVID pandemic has thrown that into some confusion. So yes, in theory, perhaps still to be delivered and a big hats off to Aileen for her, her campaign around this. Uh, Monica Saunders uh, says Community Road Watch has been severely restricted since late 2019. Uh, roads and traffic police have been uh, cut certainly since 2010, actually, with Theresa May. Um, and uh, she says, given that new cars with ISA won't be, all be in place until later the following decade, how do we address things? Because, you know, we can't wait for that to happen. Yeah, yeah, very good point, Monica. I mean, I, I, I would say that, you know, the, the, roads trans policing, the Roads Transport Policing Command have stepped up to the plate and they stepped up to the plate amazingly during the lockdown around the increase that did occur in speeding. Um, and community Road Watch was affected, but ha is now coming, you know, is coming back to life. I get the sense that Transport for London, you know, obviously, have, you know, they have suffered significantly in terms of officer capacity since the... Um, um, you know, since the pandemic, they are certainly, we are starting to hear about much more about meetings around Vision Zero and it absolutely remains fundamental that they, you know, they are, they are targeted around this. They've got a target coming up in 2022. They're aware of that. So, yeah, I think there are problems with the longer term introduction of ISA, but there are lots of things happening on the ground. But obviously a really significant thing will be the reality or the what actually happens with the, um, the funding settlement with the DFT that is due to be announced quite soon. Uh, excellent. I'm going to give you a few more because uh, we've got questions piling up. Um, evidence about how much compliance for 20 mile an hour there is by drivers when enforcement doesn't happen. In areas where there isn't traffic calming, I think it's about 80% not complying. Is that right, Jeremy? Well, I'm, no, I don't think it is right. I think there is, I, I really don't want to get into this, but I think there's yeah. been some very unhelpful um, monitoring of 20 mile an hour by the Department of Transport in their, their UK wide speeds monitoring. I would say, I would say in London now, levels of compliance with 20 mile an hour speed limits are much, much higher than that. And that's in no way to say it's good enough or or we're there on that, but th certainly that that 80% non-compliance is a, is, is is, is a UK-wide picture based on a poor selection of roads. So, uh, I mean, the, yeah, I, so I, I, I do think it's a better compliance picture than that, but I'm, I will not go into the detail of that now. Yeah, I mean, there has been quite a lot of debate about exactly how we get people to do what, you know, they do in places like Germany, which is hardly an anti-car society, where... Everybody knows that you basically shouldn't go over 30 kilometers an hour in an area which is so-called residential, uh, people crossing the road a lot. And that's what we want to try and get here. I mean, exactly how you do it in specific circumstances is, you know, always has to, you always have to look at the precise conditions and uh, what, what you're up against. But the point is to try and get to that. And it's, it's basic physics. It's about what happens from 
moped upwards in terms of weight and speed. Um, uh, yeah, just, I'll, I think we need to get on to Claire fairly soon. So I'll just say this question from Jim Smithson in Birmingham. Uh, lots of people we speak to ask about speed camera enforcement for 20 mile an hour limited roads and also average speed cameras. Is technology available for this? What are the political financial implications of using fixed site camera enforcement? Don't forget there's mobile uh, enforcement. Um, if you cycle around Regent's Park in, in London, you'll see a lot of mobile uh, use. Regent's Park and Royal Parks have gone to 20 mile an hour from 30 mile an hour. So there is a whole set of questions about using um, handheld mobile cameras. Uh, by police officers and also, but but just a quick word on average speed cameras, uh, Jeremy. Well, and that and that's partly why I said the significance of the um, the TfL funding um, agreement with the DFT. I think you know as part of the Vision Zero Action Plan, and, I'm, and what I'm going to do, if I may, is I'm going to pop the link to that in the chat in just a moment. Mm. But there was, and there's a really interesting section there around new types of speed cameras. And also, I think, Bob, you mentioned the idea of risk on roads rather than casualty based identification. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And danger at fair, source. Yeah, exactly. So, to be fair, there's a real, there's a quite a, an attention to that in the Vision Zero Action Plan. I will point people to that. But this idea of roads based on risk and then enforcement was really significant. And also there is a new generation of um, speed cameras which can operate as fixed cameras, mobile cameras, or start to be linked um, as average speed cameras. And I think that, you know, that's why, you know, funding settlements are vital to, to Vision Zero, because I think it's only then that that new generation of speed cameras can start to use, but they're all, they're much, they're potentially much more flexible than they were in the past. And I'll pop in the link in a moment to, to, that, to that in the Vision Zero action plan. Thanks a lot, Jeremy. Yeah, average speed cameras are, are more important than the ordinary fixed speed because of people speeding up and down afterwards. That applies at all speed limits. Uh, what I'm going to do is, although there have been loads of questions that I might have missed out a few, I'm going to ask Jeremy to stay with us and to be on the panel afterwards. And I'd like Claire Rogers uh, of London Cycling Campaign to talk about uh, low traffic neighbourhoods and how to engage communities with that. Over to Claire. Thanks Bob, I'm just going to share my screen if I may. Um, and of course I've gone too far ahead with my presentation. So. <laughs> well, while you're fiddling with that I'll just say that uh, Dave Shannon uh, from Islington Council has been talking about uh, the success of 20 mile an hour and what they've been doing in Islington. They were the first borough to be 20 mile an hour default on all roads in Islington. Yeah. Okay Claire, sorry. No, I'm sorry, I'm starting again, so let's... Uh, nearly there. Okay, can you see that okay? That's fine. Okay, brilliant. Um, so I'm, I'm Claire Rogers, I'm a um, Healthy Streets campaigner for London Cycling Campaign. Um, and I was given the title, Low Traffic Neighbourhoods Winning Over Communities. And I'd, <laughs> while I was preparing this talk, I thought, I'm going to change this title because Winning over communities feels a bit, bit premature, a bit ambitious. Um, it's where we're getting to, but I'm, I'm changing it to building community support, which feels a bit more manageable. And I'm sure everyone's seen all the fuss that there's been about low traffic neighbourhoods in the press. So it's, it's quite a battleground at the moment. Um, so just a bit about myself. Um, <clears throat> I started, I've been working for a London Cycling Campaign for about a year before that I was a volunteer campaigner. Um, and my, my sort of campaigning journey started in Enfield where I live. Um, about five years ago, we were given funding to be a mini Holland in, in Enfield um, to invest in walking and cycling. And there was massive backlash to the proposed cycle lanes. Um, and so we founded, a group of us founded Better Streets for Enfield. Um, and the idea was to broaden out the argument because it was seen as this is all just for cyclists. And most people don't see themselves as cyclists. We wanted to change the argument from rather than being normal people versus cyclists, we changed it to um, people friendly streets versus traffic dominated streets because that's really what the conversation was about. 
Um, since then, I've helped to set up groups. Um, there's a Better Streets for Kensington and Chelsea. There's a Westminster Healthy Streets group. And then nothing to do with me. There's loads popping up all over London, Tower Hamlets, um, Harrow, Croydon. So it's, it's an idea that's taking off, which is really good to see. Um, so Better Streets groups try and um, offer solutions um, to our traffic dominated car dependent um, towns and, and cities that we live in. And so for instance, this is the Enfield set of asks. Um, top of our list is we want low traffic neighbourhoods in every ward of Enfield. Um, we also want a joined up network of safe walking cycling, pedestrian friendly high streets, of course 20 miles an hour since Jeremy came and gave us talking to. And we want school streets um, for all our schools. So we try and offer, offer solutions. Um, and we're all about building coalitions as well. Um, so in Enfield, we are um, informally with the Living Street Circle Group as well as the London Cycling Campaign local group. Um, and some sort of better streets type groups are actually coalitions. Um, so for instance, in Lambeth, you've got Lambeth Cycling Campaign have teamed up with Lambeth Living Streets. Mums for Lungs, Friends of the Earth, um, and also Wheels for Wellbeing, and that's Isabel Clements, um, giving a thumbs up to a, a modal filter in, in Lambeth. Um, and as Better Streets groups, often what we're doing is campaigning for low traffic neighbourhoods. And just so really quickly, I just suddenly thought, I wonder if everyone knows what a low traffic neighbourhood is. And I just talk about them and think about them and dream about them 24 hours a day. So I don't want to assume that everyone does. Um, I don't have a map of my presentation because I've just forgotten, I just made that assumption. But a low traffic neighbourhood is basically taking a block of streets surrounded by main roads or other severances like railway lines and ensuring that a vehicle, a motor vehicle can't pass through as a shortcut any of those streets. So it's about ending rat running and it's done with things like this lovely planter, the ones behind me, which is in my neighbourhood. Um, so any, anyone can walk or cycle or scoot or, or use a, a mobility scooter through those barriers, um, but a car can't and cars are redirected on the main roads, which is where we think they should be. So that's a low traffic neighbourhood in a nutshell. Um, so as Better Streets groups, why are low traffic neighbourhoods so important to us? Talk about that first and I'll go on to how, how um, some of the ways in which we try to, to support them. So um, this rather shocking information came out recently from the Department for Transport. Um, for a start, so just taking London alone, um, in the last 10 years we've seen the growth by billions of vehicle miles driven in London. Um, the, I haven't got the, the, the number in my head, but it's, it's shocking. Um, and since in, in these last 10 years, it's where these vehicle miles have been driven that's really shocking. So you'll see that A roads have actually decreased in traffic slightly um, and B roads. Motorways have stayed much the same. But where the traffic has grown by 70% is on those unclassified roads, those narrow residential streets. That's where the traffic is going. And there's no prizes for guessing why. Um, sat -navs, especially apps like Waze on people's phones, have just made it so much easier to find those routes. Um, and that's where all traffic's going. And if you're just um, turning along, following your sat-nav, not paying attention, that's where you'll be taken. So one reason to campaign for um, LTNs is danger, is road danger. And um, I came across this, um, this is an excellent article by Rachel, Dr. Rachel Aldridge. And I only came across it because of the excellent Lambeth Living Streets Twitter account, which did a great tweet thread on it. But um, in this, Rachel talks about the, um, just the risk of, of danger and injury because of this, this rat running. Um, and she's, she finds that each mile driven on an urban residential road results in 17% more deaths or serious injuries to pedestrians than when it's driven on a main road. For minor injuries, it goes up to 66%. This means that a driver taking a mile on an urban residential street is twice as likely to kill or seriously injure a child walking and three times more likely to kill or seriously injure a child on a bike than if they stuck to the main road. And this is to do, as she goes on to say, this is to do with the fact that on a residential road, you're less likely to have a formal crossing, you won't have a formal crossing, you'll have more people walking and potentially cycling, and you've got lots of blind corners. And at the end of the day, these roads are not designed for through traffic. 
that's not where the, the through traffic should be and this is why they are so dangerous. So that's, you could say that's a number one reason, especially in the context of this, of this webinar, um, why to, to campaign for a low traffic neighbourhood. But there are so many, there are at least three billion other reasons why we should campaign for low traffic neighbourhoods. And this is another one, that they boost active travel and they reduce car use. So really interesting study on Hackney, um, written up by Brian Deegan. Um, Hackney for 10 years just really concentrated on putting in modal filters. They didn't do sort of cycle lanes so much. They really concentrated on, on low traffic neighbourhoods. And the result was between 2001-2011, cycling trips more than tripled, cycling mode share for work trips more than doubled, <coughs> and car use halved. So that's a really impressive set of statistics which LTMs can, can bring about. So I hope that's given you um, plenty of reasons to campaign for low traffic neighbourhoods. And I just want to talk about how we found this effective, um, growing community support, things that we found effective um, in the different places that I've been working and campaigning. Um, this is my own lovely neighbourhood, which I'm sitting in right now, although I'm, I'm not sitting in the middle of the road in case you're worried, I'm actually in my, my study. Um, these are my neighbours, this is my neighbourhood. Um, we did a photo shoot to show you how much support there is for a low traffic neighbourhood. That neighbourhood has now been trialled and it's utterly transformational, really enjoying it. I can't believe it when I go out on these quiet streets and see kids cycling. Um, so what we found a really effective um, way to support them is, is to have these local neighbourhood groups. Um, so people who um, live in that neighbourhood and really get what the problem is and really grasp what the solution is as well. Um, and in Enfield, we've got two um, LTNs, as I call them, for speeds being implemented. And both of them have really active neighbourhood groups um, supporting them. Um, and I think it's a similar story in Lambeth. You might have come across the Railton LTN on Twitter, if you're on Twitter. Um, they're doing a great job of supporting their LTN and other, other groups in Lambeth as well. Um, and I think other campaigning organisations like Living Streets tend to have local neighbourhood groups. Um, so it's, it's a good, effective um, way to campaign. So in Enfield, oh, how do I go back? There we go. Um, just some ideas on how we started these groups. It, it, it was different for different groups, but um, often it was going along and giving a presentation as Rest of Streets for Enfield at a ward forum or a residence association. Um, and, and then in Westminster, Westminster Healthy Streets, it's just aiming to have a contact on the websites for every ward in the borough so that people can contact their uh, local Healthy Streets rep and we're hoping for, for groups to build around that. But what, what really tends to galvanise groups growing is opposition. So we would set up tiny neighbourhood groups and then a, a, a scheme would be proposed, the opposition would kick off big time and suddenly those groups got a lot of support from people going, no, I want a low traffic neighbourhood. This, this, might, this might not happen, this might get overturned. I want to support it. And so um, this is a, a poster from, from Bose, Bones Green one of our low traffic neighbourhoods, so it has got huge support um, as well as a lot of attacking. And then, um, we, it's, it, I mean, you, you may have seen if you're on social media, it has, it's been nasty. And we've had people who you know, have had opponents of the scheme coming around on their doorsteps. There's been swearing, there's been racism, there's been trolling on, on social media. It can make it really nasty. The fact that emergency LTNs have gone in with very little notice or consultation has just made it that much worse. But on the whole, although you hear about the occasional low traffic neighbourhoods being taken out, on the whole, they're standing firm. Um, councils are standing firm. Enfield certainly is. Um, and I think it really helps that these groups are on the ground saying, this is working for us. We love our low traffic neighbourhoods. So these groups, um, the ones that I'm involved in, are supporting each other. They all tend to be on WhatsApp. Um, how did any campaigning get done before WhatsApp? I can't remember, but um, it's, it's a really useful tool, if slightly annoying. Um, and so people will be engaging with their own street WhatsApp groups, a lot of those sprung up in COVID or on Facebook or Nextdoor, and then they come back and, and kind of they've got the support group of their own pro LTN WhatsApp group. Um, and that's been, that's been really useful. Um, one, one of the groups that I'm in has got a WhatsApp group and it's got a representative from every street in the low traffic neighbourhood. So that's 20 plus streets and that's really useful. 
Um, and then these groups will get, they've had people come and talk to them on Zoom, like a campaign from Walton Forest came and, and shared some, some tips and that was, that was useful as well. So as a, um, as a borough group in Enfield, um, we try and support them. We've got a, a page on our website for each of our, each of our groups. We try and put them in touch with other campaigners, um, connections to the council, but we support them to lead um, because they are, they are the experts on their own neighbourhoods. They are the people talking to their own neighbours. So we let them, we let them take the lead. Um, this is a, an FAQs page on Better Streets about low traffic neighbourhoods. It's a very long list of contents that goes down. Um, and that's really useful. People can link to that on social media rather than get into a spat. You can just say, um, you just link to that particular section and it just, it saves time. Um, We've been really encouraging good communication. This is a, a flyer we've been inspired by that comes from Waltham Forest. Uh, we want community streets, not commuter streets. Um, and of course the award-winning um, road open signs, these sprung up in Lambeth, they were designed by activists, local activists, as a response to the road closed signs. And they make a very obvious statement that these roads are not closed, they are open, finally open to everyone. Um, started off by activists, but they're now being adopted by councils, including Enfield, which is using, using them on its planters. And so um, my final point really is one, once you've got an LTN, should you be fortunate enough, how to support it, how to make sure that it doesn't just fold, as we saw in, in Wandsworth and other places. Um, and we really think, and this, I've taken this a page out of Lambert's book again, and Sarah Berry, who's an outstanding activist there, is, is not to have fights on social media, is not to get angry, um, it's, it's to celebrate and share the good news. So um, on social media we've had lots of images of good things that are happening, um, things that we're enjoying. In real life, we've had events like play streets. Um, this, these pictures here of wobbly bikers. This was um, a woman in um, the neighbourhood that I'm in who just said on the WhatsApp group, hey, let's all get our rusty bikes out of our sheds. I haven't cycled for years, doesn't matter. Let's, let's be wobbly bikers together. So um, she, she did that and, and the local cycle campaign members were there desperately pumping up tyres and oiling things. And then they all went off wobbling around the neighbourhoods with kids, um, disabled, child, um, middle-aged women, it was fantastic. Um, someone else in the same group posted a map of the neighbourhood and said, here are some walking routes and here are some points of interest along the way. Why don't you try, let's all do this together at different times on the same day so that we're socially distanced. In Lambeth, someone built a, a bench attached to a planter so people could sit down, have a break, chat to one another. Um, and they also painted lovely colourful shapes on the road to say, look, something special is, is happening here. Um, so it's all about celebrating, sharing the good news, rather than getting into battles, because even myth-busting doesn't work. Even if you try, you can try and myth-bust, bust myths till you're blue in the face, but sometimes you just reinforce what the person what was already chosen to believe. So it's better just to celebrate the good news. Um, and this was a, a tweet that I put up this week. Um, I, was, I did it in a moment of high emotion because... Um, I was on this ride, we were with a group that included two kids and this family with another two kids appeared on bikes. This road I did for three years on the school run. I was the only person cycling with my child on the back of the tandem. No one rides, no child rides a bike on this road. It's nearly 7,000 vehicles a day. Now it's an LTN, suddenly the kids come from nowhere, suddenly they're able to cycle. And I'm hoping that this will extend to the school run, I think it already is. So that was a good thing to celebrate on social media. Finally, um, I don't know if you saw there's a YouGov poll, poll this week that came out. Um, it turns out that actually the silent majority does support low traffic neighbourhoods. So if you put together strongly support and tend to support, you've got 57% and that's across the UK. So we see all the, the stuff in the media and we think everyone hates them, but actually most people support them. And, you know, there's a good chunk in the middle that don't really care. And the opposition is actually only 16%. So that's a really good thing to bear in mind. And so the, the final, final thing I want to say is when you're supporting one of these, usually there's a trial that goes on for six to 18 months. And it's all about getting people to respond to the consultation that happens during that trial to say to the council, yes, I love it. And that's, that's the battle because people who love it 
won't bother to say that this is quite nice I can hear the birds singing and then they don't bother to tell anyone so it, it, you know that involves putting flyers through doors that involves knocking on doors and saying to people you know if you like this if you want to keep it please please get back to the council um, and then we can finally keep these amazing schemes and see them stretch across the, the country and that's it for me thank you oh thank you Claire that was wonderful um, particularly that, you know, I like that last slide that uh, just came out, that research. Um, can I just point out to people the kind of things we're discussing today, uh, particularly on low traffic neighbourhoods, are discussed on the weekly webinar for transport professionals and campaigners called Ideas with Beers. Um, actually, it doesn't really have anything to do with beer, but uh, it's... Um, uh, if you email ideaswithbeers at gmail.com, uh, Brian Deegan, who organises it, will uh, send you the links to attend on Tuesdays at 5pm. Uh, technical thing, Roger said that uh, the slides weren't being, sh were, were kind of out of sync. Um, that might have happened with some of you, but anyway, it's all being recorded, so you'll be able to see it all afterwards. Um, quick correction, it's Professor Rachel Aldred now, Professor, not just Doctor, yes, um, and just the thing, uh, just want to ask Claire something about definitions of low traffic neighbourhoods, uh, because actually what they've done in Manchester under Chris Borden is they've done something quite interesting, they call them active neighbourhoods, and a lot of people uh, seem to uh, uh, like that. Um, in Hackney, they were saying where they've been doing modal filters for ooh, 15, 20 years. Um, and of course, there are a lot of low traffic neighbourhoods which went in decades ago. Uh, they're saying that some just having a few planters and filters isn't really a full proper LTN. And Susie Morrow asked Claire, uh, thank you for your definition of LTNs. What's your view of LTNs so-called formed by restricted turns for motor vehicles such that the main direction of approach is prohibited, but some approach directions remain possible? Does this count as a low traffic neighborhood in your view? Claire. So I... I don't feel like an, an expert, I'm not an engineer. Um, mm -hmm. what, I, what I do know, having talked to people who are much more expert than me, is that, um, by which I mean Simon Monk, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> he's a big campaigner in this area. Um, what, 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 we, what I understand is that kind of the gold standard is to have these modal filters like the one in my background picture, um, because it's, it just means that there's no, you know, you can't leave anything open. So in the, in the, what you're talking about, um, it can be a way of restricted terms and alternating one ways is, is a way of, of creating a low traffic neighbourhood. Um, but it, it runs a risk of leaving a rat run open. Um, and more, well, just as worryingly, it, 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 it takes away the opportunity to reclaim road space. So if you if you close a junction, except to cyclists and, and walkers, you can then put in a parklet, you can put in some seating, you can claim that space back from the road. Um, you can really tighten up a junction, have some plants there. Um, you can't do that where it's a series of restricted bands, uh, restricted turns. In the low traffic neighbourhood behind me, um, one of the junctions has got a, a band turn um, and it's not working very well. So it's mostly filters, like the ones behind me, but then there's one band turn, and I've got a friend who lives on that road, and she's very resentful about the low traffic neighbourhoods. Um, so what she does is she approaches the road that has a band turn, she does a U-turn in the roads along with all her neighbours, and then drives into her road as she would, normally would do from the other direction. So it's, it, it, it's, it's just not as good, I would say, as... Um, having a physical barrier or at least a, a camera, a camera gate, which allows access to emergency vehicles. So I hope that helps to answer your question. Yeah, thanks. Um, do you want to say anything about uh, actually how they're enforced? I mean, first of all, a quick thing is that uh, everybody says, uh, all the opponents say, 
oh, you know, emergency vehicles can't get through. That's not true. Um, they are consulted on these things. But the actual uh, mechanism, lockable bollards, cameras, uh, tell us a bit about that, Claire. So this has caused a huge ruckus in Enfield. I'm sure it's not just Enfield. And there's been pictures on social media of a, you know, an ambulance driver throwing up his hands in front of a, a bollard that he can't unlock. Um, and it, it, as, as you say, Bob, that it's, a lot of this is actually communication. So the ambulance bosses, um, fire, fire service bosses were, were consulted. They were walked through the plans. They didn't raise any objection. And that's why it went ahead. The problem is it doesn't seem to have trickled down always to the, the drivers. So um, all, all of the sat-nav equipment, and I don't know how this is happening, but um, drivers don't seem to be following the most obvious new route, but trying to use the old route. Um, and because they've chosen not to carry devices that will open lockable bollards, um, because they, their plan was to use the routes that are already open and to use camera gates, um, then they come to bollards and they can't, they can't unlock them. So I think... Um, I think it's just teething problems really and that, that message needs to trickle down internally the communications. Um, I think it will be it will be fine. And we know from Waltham Forest that actually in the long run response times have, begin, have become quicker, you know, just by half a minute or so they've become quicker overall and that's probably because of the removal of traffic from those streets that ambulances are trying to, to drive down. I mean it is interesting because uh, years ago I was pointing out that uh, uh, the lockable bollards, uh, the fire brigade have keys, the ambulance and police tend not to, but in fact you should actually be able to have some form of uh, modern technology which allows, uh, it allows emergency vehicles to just put them up and down as they turn up and I mean I would personally like to see that kind of come in so that would very effectively deal with those rather in a, a you know well, shall we just say wrong criticisms? Um, I uh, we're at five past five now. I mean, we've got a lot of good questions. Uh, David Davis has asked people about the road safety support uh, article and how we feel about it. Um, and there are a couple of other questions, but I'd like to leave them till the end. Oh, Bob's frozen. Okay, I think what I'll, I'll do then, I'll, I'll start talking um, about PCCs and then what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll have a session at the end afterwards to go through um, all of the um, questions that people have put in the Q&A box. Um, my presentation is very short indeed, so it won't take uh, very long at all. Um, my name is Vicky Lebrecht. Um, I manage the uh, policy uh, campaigns and communications for Road Peace, which is the national charity for road crash victims. Um, I'm going to talk to you um, very briefly today about um, about about PCC, so uh, the police and, and and crime commissioners. And I really, it's more. It's more to, I guess, to get people excited because we've got the elections that are coming up in May 2021, so May next year. They were meant to happen this year. Um, PCCs, for those, for those who don't know, they're yeah, police and crime commissioners. They don't have so much say in terms of the uh, oper operations um, of the police as such, but they're elected and they are there really to hold the police to account. Um, they have the power to fire the, the chief constable um, and also to represent the, the, the community's interests. So they are really quite important in that sense in terms of being able to influence um, police priorities and particularly around traffic law enforcement. So it's quite exciting really that we've got these elections um, coming up. Um, I think what's interesting is that some of the work that we've um, done, and I should say that I've been working with um, Action Vision Zero with, with, with Jeremy and colleagues, um, and also 20s, plenty on this. Um, we've looked at, at the uh, PCC plans um, because they publish um, police and crime plans when uh, they come into power to kind of outline uh, the priorities that they have. Um, the majority of them put road safety down as a priority. I think there's quite a lot of discrepancy in terms of how much 
attention and how much detail um, and the type of, um, I guess, the, the, the type of enforcement that, uh, the, 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 the PCC is advocating for within those plans. Um, but that I think should be seen as um, quite good really, because in the past that, that wasn't the case where you had the majority of them uh, having road safety as a priority. So I think that's something um, that's really good. Um, I think also that the other thing to bear in mind as well is that I think a lot of the current candidates aren't standing for re-election. So there's quite a big opportunity there to then influence the ones that are coming in. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, Jeremy mentioned um, Alison Hernandez, who's the, the PCC for Devon and Cornwall. She's nationally the, um, the lead on roads policing amongst um, the PCCs. Um, and the Association of Police and Crime Commissioners, and I think that was pushed forward by her, um, commissioned um, a survey to understand the public's view, really, I suppose, of um, traffic offences and, and what people think that should be done about it. Um, and I think I mean, the reason I'm telling you about this is because we should feel encouraged that the public is uh, wanting the police to do more around road crime and traffic offences. So I'll, I'll run through the, the outcome of that survey. Um, it was a it was a really uh, well responded to. So there were sixty six thousand two hundred and sixty six people who responded to the survey. Seventy eight uh, percent say that they saw road traffic offences uh, on a daily or weekly basis. Um, seven out of ten respondents um, either agreed or strongly agreed that a fixed penalty notices for road traffic offences like speeding, uh, which are currently one hundred pounds, should be increased in line with other serious offences like driving whilst using a handheld mobile, mobile phone. Um, and eighty-eight percent of respondents either agreed or strongly agreed that some of the money raised through fixed penalty notices should be reinvested into enforce, enforcement and road safety measures um, to deny criminal use of roads. So I think that's so encouraging. Well, what's that? That's telling us that the public, um, you know, wants more to be done around traffic offences, and we've got this opportunity coming up with the PCCs um, being um, elected next year. Um, we. We will be um, publishing a manifesto over the next um, couple of weeks, which we'll be using to um, approach the PCCs and have conversations with them. Um, and also in terms of getting, um, encouraging campaigners to adopt our cause. And uh, I, I will share this with all of you once um, it's done. It's being produced by Road Peace, um, Action Vision Zero and 2020. Um, but there's five, five key priority really. Um, I think the first one is, making road danger reduction a priority, that's that's the first. Um, also to tackle speeding, I think everything that Jeremy covered off there um, in his presentation just goes to show why that's so important. Um, being transparent and accountable be the third. Um, collaborating with the community and also improving the post-crash response because that's something that um, impacts victims a lot in terms of um, what the police are able to do. So yeah, so that's a very short presentation, but. Um, it's to say really that, we, that there will be more to share with you soon and, and uh, it's an exciting opportunity to be able to influence um, traffic law enforcement in Britain. Thanks. <laughs> Bob, you're on um, mute Yes, again. I'm not. I'm back here. You're, yes. Oh yeah, you're back. Um, don't seem to have got any questions about that. I mean, what we did have right at the beginning uh, is we had uh, someone uh, very angrily saying, uh, here we are, uh, da, 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 da. Uh, what is the point of the PCC if they all they can say is uh, that uh, we don't get involved with operational matters, blah, blah, blah. I do have to say that um, we uh, uh, were very involved as Secretariat with West Midlands Police Road Home Prevention Team and uh, some people in traffic uh, police in West Midlands have been changing their messaging uh, from road danger reduction back in terms of the worst of traditional road safety. And I've tried to contact the PCC, uh, who was originally quite supportive, and uh, he just seems to not reply. I mean, you know, 
do people find that you know what is people's I don't know, Jeremy, do you have any, uh, what, what's your view on PCCs? Uh, don't forget, we don't have PCC in London, but uh, yeah. tell us about uh, our, the rest of, of the UK. Well, I, said, I suppose it's just to pick up on what Vicky was just saying. And we, I mean, and we've been working with Amy Eyre and Thomas, who I know is on this call and, um, you know, is amazingly experienced in this area. Um, and what we did was we thought it would be good to start talking to PCC and try and have a dialogue with them. So, you know, we, we can constructed the letter around roads, policing, enforcement, around the issue of transparency and community engagement and trying to encourage that and wrote to all the 40 um, England and Wales PCCs. And we were, you know, we were really surprised at the response we got. We did. We, I mean, it, to a letter from somebody unknown, it's sort of, you know, and this is, again, working with Action Vision Zero, Road Peace and 2020. Um, we, we, you know, we did get a response from around, I'd say around 10 of them, which is not bad, but we also then did have a meeting with um, Alison Hernandez from Devon and Cornwall, as Vicky said, is the lead on this. And it was really encouraging to hear her. She said something which was, I thought was really revealing. She said it was almost like road speed is the, inf the elephant in the room. She said that all the PCCs know this is a massive issue. It's one of the biggest things that come into their email. And yet the very the very thing that they feel is almost like hardest to tackle is speed. And I do, you know, I think this absolutely reflects the whole foundation for 20s Plenty as a campaign. And um, what was really interesting was she said, well, you know, that's not what I'm like. I'm going to tackle this. <laughs> and she was a was bravura performance. And, you know, she said, I'm going to, if that's what people are telling me is an issue, we are going to tackle this. Um, and I think she's, you know, to be fair to her, she's now really starting to take steps, both in terms of raising it as an issue, ensuring the resources are there for the policing teams, but also really crucially is this issue of engagement. And she's prepared to talk to people. And then, and just as Bob finally said, although London isn't part of, um, you know, the PCC structure, what's really amazing is the way that the, the Met Police, through the Roads Tra Transport Policing Command, which is a joint venture with Transport for London, have been prepared to talk to campaigners, activists, and to really encourage a dialogue with people, as is evidenced by, you know, Andy Cox's, um, you know, amazing performance on, on Twitter, which echoes the work that the West, Mid West Midlands Police did previously. So yes, it's a problem. Yes, there's been problems in the past, but there's a fantastic opportunity, as Vicky says, to pick up on the elections and know that it's to try and say, you've heard these issues, how can you engage with them better? Thanks for that. Yeah, um, uh, I think now, can we just have a sort of general panel thing for the next uh, quarter of an hour or so? I think I uh, don't seem to have got any more questions specifically on PCCs. Um, just picking up myself, a uh, thing Jeremy said about the work of um, DCS Cox on Twitter and social media. There have been some very good police Twitter accounts back in the day, Surrey Roads Policing Unit, uh, Westman's Police Road Harm Prevention Team, uh, actually just communicating messages to members of the public about what's right, what's wrong. This is all very much a question of talking about it, saying what the problems are, what we need to do. Um, and that, of course, uh, uh, I've got one question here saying, you know, when we're talking about enforcement of speed, uh, why don't we get involved in talking to drivers in the first place. Now, the thing that comes to mind there with me is that with the policing of close passing of cyclists, uh, which was pioneered by West Midlands Police in 2016, um, got a special award from us. Uh, what they do is after stopping motorists is the first few cases, and in most cases generally, uh, you would simply pull the, the driver over and say, look, you've been doing this wrong, and you'd explain why it was wrong. And mention that, you know, we will in the future have to give a minor penalty, namely three penalty points and fine, uh, if this is done again. And uh, so this whole thing, policing is involved with getting the message over, low traffic neighborhoods, you have to engage with people, 
uh, the police and crime commissioners were trying to raise issues in the public. It's all about getting cultural shift and cultural change and the way all these things uh, are involved. Um, let's... Uh, uh, I'm just trying to think of what the first question I can raise for you. Ah, yes, a bollards question for uh, Roger asks Claire, do you know if any local authorities have tried floppy bollards that emergency vehicles can drive over? Do you know that, Claire? Claire, you're well, muted. Something, something I don't know enough about. I know that some have, and I'm, I'm yes, that would be a really good question to direct to um, Simon Monk or Simon Still um, at, uh, at London Cycling Campaign because I can't remember what the verdict was about ben bendy bollards, as we call them. Yeah. Okay, that's I've it. certainly seen them in Hackney, and it doesn't take long till they look pretty destroyed. So, um, yeah, they, Hackney have tried them, and quite what the verdict is on that, I don't know. Righty ho. Um, yeah, now, Peter Goodman in Farnham said... Um, what happens if you can't get a low traffic neighborhood? What happens if you're just trying to do things for cyclists only? I mean, it, it, I think what we're all trying to do is we're trying to broaden things out. Things that are good for cyclists are good for walkers in most cases. Uh, these things are all good for local community, for everybody. Uh, I, I assume you'd all say that, Claire, you'd say that. That's a, an emphasis, something that we're trying to do. I think, I mean, what, it really helps us to bring people together in, in Enfield to campaign for low traffic neighbourhoods um, rather than, than cycle lanes, although we were supporting those as well. But I mean, the beauty of low traffic neighbourhoods is they do enable people to cycle. Um, so you can do it as a cycle campaign or you can do it as someone who just doesn't want their child to be killed on the, on, on the street. It's, you know, it, it covers everyone, covers everything. Um, and it was really interesting to see in Hackney how just putting in low traffic neighbourhoods um, reduced car use so much and, and boosted cycling and walking so much. So um, what you, you, can, you can do it, you can do it in that order. You can say, right, let's campaign for low traffic neighbourhoods, cycling will go up. And then you can say, right, now our main roads need some treatment. We need to get these cyclists across main roads into the next low traffic neighbourhood. Or we, and we need tracks on, on the main roads often. So you can you can do it that way. Um, it, it, that's exactly what Hackney did, for instance. Yeah, Jeremy. And just really quickly, so I live off the Walworth Road, which is runs due south towards Camberwell from the Elephant and Castle. Um, you know, residential areas, both sides of the Walworth Road, relatively deprived area. Um, we've got two low traffic neighbourhoods being constructed either side of the Walworth Road. Um, you know, obviously we're seeing more people cycling around, but what we're really, really seeing is more people able to walk into the, you know, this Spine High Street, which is the Walworth Road, which is, you know, in the pandemic has been a lifeline for people in our area. You know, it's where everybody, people haven't been into town, people go naturally to shop at the High Street. You've made, started to make the conditions so much safer for people. And again, there's, there's, there's obviously a livability and a environmental argument, but there's also an economic argument that this lifeline is given support by having low traffic neighbourhoods on, on our, you know, on either side of the high street. So I do, I do think even in Millie Hol Mini Holland days, it may have started off as a sort of cycling project. I think pedestrians are huge beneficiaries of low traffic neighbourhoods. Yeah. Um, someone asked about uh, you know, saying my council is hopeless, they really don't want to do things under the Emergency Active Travel Fund. How are we getting through to them? Um, you know, what can we do? And Claire said, can I answer a question about getting councils to start building LTNs? So Claire, or did you already do that? I, I might have been a bit too keen to answer that. No, no, please be keen. I've, yes. I've crossed down some points. Um, so varying degrees of ambition. You can do things, something we did in Westminster, um, Westminster Healthy Streets put up a, a map. We happen to have a, a map geek as our chair. And, um, but you can do this from Commonplace, that you can pay Commonplace um, on the internet to, to do this for you. Where you, it's like you conduct a, like, as the council should be doing, you, can, you conduct a consultation. You say, hey, everyone, come and put on this map where you want to see a low traffic neighborhood or you want to see a cycle lane, whatever it is you want. 
Um, and in Westminster, we did that when um, the council were calling for COVID measures, street space measures, and we got more than a thousand pins dropped on our map. But it just showed the council that actually there is a real appetite for things like low traffic neighbourhoods. You know, lots of people asking for their high streets to be closed and, and to traffic and, and so on. So that, that's one sort of technical solution. Um, another is go, just go straight to your councillors. People do not email or talk to their councillors enough. That's something that I've, I've really learnt. Um, you, you know, you can send a million tweets, but it's the email that gets through. You know, ask for, ask for a meeting, talk to your wall councillors, talk to your, um, your, your cabinet member if you can. Um, and, and just present, present the evidence to them. You can go to one of our websites, um, go to Best Streets Renfield or Westminster Healthy Streets or London Living Streets have got great articles on low traffic neighbourhoods and just make the case that way. You can talk to residents associations, a lot of, um, if you've got a powerful residents association, you can go blue in the face trying to talk about cycling, but if you talk about low traffic neighbourhoods, you'll find that everyone hates rat running and you've, you'll get a lot of traction often in a residence association. We were really surprised we gave a talk in, in Belgravia, which is not somewhere you think of as being sort of open to healthy street measures, but people in Belgravia really want to end the rat running on their, on their streets. Um, you can t take your councillors on a tour of, of Waltham Forest and see what you know the ultimate low traffic neighbourhood area looks like. Um, and they run tours. You, you, there are a couple of um, activists there and council officers who run really good tours. Um, you can put up a website, just put up a one page website saying this is the area in which we want to see a low traffic neighbourhood. This is, these are the boundary roads. We want all of this to be healthy low traffic streets with clean air where kids can play. Um, and, and, and tweet it around and, 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 and build it up. Um, those are some of the things that we've done and that I'm sure it's, it's, it's not an exhaustive list. What was, sorry, Kay, what was the name of um, the, the website where, which was acting like a consultation website? So common, Commonplace, and it's often used by councils um, and apparently it, you can use it as a non-council or non-business organisation. Haven't done it myself, but I've been told that, so it's it's something to look into. Yeah. Um, one thing, uh, there's a question from Peter Goodman saying, but if people can't get to school or town as they are beyond an LCN, then an LCN won't help. I mean, you know, there's always this question that really you have to start off somewhere. Um, you know, uh, so, yeah, you want some cycle facilities. Yes, you want enforcement. Yes, you want LTNs. Uh, yes, you want third party reporting. We were talking about all last week and you can go further uh, and you, you want speed reduction as well. So, yes, you want everything, but you have to kind of start off somewhere. Is, is that the way you're thinking, Jeremy and Claire? Yeah, I'm sorry. I've just put a whole load of links on the um, on the chat about um, publicly available data sources. So there's an amazing array now of, of of data sources that are really accessible through mapping. And I think Claire's made some fantastic points there. But I would also say, you know, making the story through visual data is incredibly powerful, but also incredibly easy nowadays. Now, you know, you might want to mix up the data sources that you use to build the story. And, you know, there's, there's other ones like public health and obesity, but it's really, really easy to access this data now. And I would, um, I would, as well as the conversation side, I would try and build the story through this amazing array of publicly available data. Yeah, I'm um, just specifically on, you know, th there's this question that somebody feels look, there's a campaign for an LTN, but the LTN doesn't actually do me any good. I don't live in that area. Um, you know, what about me? Um, I want to cycle into town and so on. Uh, so, you know, I was just raising the issue that we, uh, you know, you have to start somewhere and you also want to raise these other issues as well at the same time, or do you wait, or do you throw all your energies into one campaign? Uh, I don't know, Claire, do you have any views on that? Yeah, you just, it, it, it's more, more and more is needed, isn't it? And um, yeah. in, in Enfield, um, for a long time, our cabinet member, 
was up for cycle lanes, we got a lot of cycle lanes put in, but wouldn't even consider a single modal filter, wouldn't close a single road through traffic. Um, and then he was replaced and then slowly we're getting our low traffic neighbourhoods. Um, and, it, 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 you know, we, we focused on two areas as campaigners. We said we'd start with these areas because one is the, the need is very obvious and the other there was just very a lot of support from residents. They've been campaigning for up to 30 years. So, you know, those are those are the low hanging fruit. Start with those. They will be successful um, and then it'll be easier to, to move out to other other places in the in the borough. There's also a, a very useful TFL um, tool that, that shows where, where the priority LCNs should go and they look at things like um, road collisions. I'm hoping Jeremy's going to type it into the chat. <laughs> um, and uh, social deprivation and, and, um, and things like that. So that could be a place to say, look, here's the highest priority one, start there and then please roll them out. Yeah, I mean, I think it relates to a question that John Stewart, long term campaigner, former road piece uh, committee member, uh, saying how would people deal with the opposition from residents on main roads, genuinely worried LTNs will mean more traffic on their roads? What do you do, Claire? And also, uh, also I mean, I, I can say what I'd say, which is that we need those other messages like uh, road pricing, smart charging, uh, high levels of enforcement, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, as well, ASAP, and that uh, a lot of the displacement that occurs is temporary. Uh, would you add on anything to that, Claire? Yes, so overall LTN to reduce traffic. So, I mean, Walton Forest is a really good example because it's a few years ago. It has, it has reduced overall levels of traffic and the, the, the bordering main roads where everyone was worried about traffic displacement did see traffic displacement, but within 12 months it had subsided to almost um, pre-levels. And since then, I think one, one bordering road around this, the first scheme is below um, pre-scheme levels. But the point is that it's um, it's reduced air pollution. It's 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 um, increased walking, especially and cycling as well, massively. Um, it's reduced even car car ownership has dropped by twenty percent in the areas that got the most treatments, according to Professor Rachel Aldred. Um, so you know the 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 effects are undeniable. <laughs> it's natural to worry about about main roads, but main roads need a different kind of treatment to be healthy. Those, those neighbourhoods need, they should be access only, there's just no question that is the way to make a neighbourhood safe. But the bordering main roads need different treatment, they need 20 miles an hour, they need um, cycle lanes, sometimes they need safe crossings. Um, you're, you're looking at different treatments to make those healthy routes. Mm. Yes, Jeremy, can, yeah. Vicky, can I just share the screen for one second, is that okay? Yeah, you're quiet, Vicky. Yeah, I think, you, I think you're allowed to, are you not? Or, is it, or is it saying I'm not? Just really quickly, I don't know whether you want to do a screen grab of this, anybody, but um, this is some work that Living Streets has done, London Living Streets has done around, just as um, Claire and Bob have referred to, the, you know, potential measures at a local, a local level around main roads that are adjacent to low traffic neighbourhoods. So, you know, I think there's immediate direct action, there's indirect action that local or authority can take, and then there's support that's needed, exactly as Bob said, around you, you know, ultra low emission zone road user charging. So there's just, I mean, it's not perfect, it doesn't address everything, but it's it's the kind of conversations that need to be need to be had. And I hope that's I hope that's of some use. I, I just want to say one other thing about difficult councils. I do um, you know, and ones that are reluctant to embrace this. A lot of boroughs have now, a lot of local authorities have taken on the whole issue of em climate emergency declarations. And I do think they are, they're absolutely, a, you know, another campaigning tool to say, you've agreed to do this. You know, this was not, you know, this was not free. You know, when you signed up to the cli em climate emergency declaration, I hope you didn't think there was nothing involved in this. So I do think there's a very powerful tool working with local authorities. That, and also there's a whole conversation around air pollution, which, you know, every time you look at it, it feels as though it's, you know, every element of air pollution is more and more significant. And I do think that there's, again, that, that whole narrative is about what we've got to do fundamentally is reduce traffic 
and remove fossil fuel driven vehicles from our streets and that's got to happen as soon as possible. Thanks very much. Although as a bit of a pedant, I like saying motor traffic because uh, pedestrians and cyclists are also traffic. Um, a quickie, nice little observation from Jim Smith, Smithson in Birmingham. We get a small amount of traction by pointing to old, older LTNs that have been in place for years and everybody's just got used to them. Um, so do mention them. Um, I'm conscious of the time. Uh, I just have a quick question. Uh, Roger Stocker asks, Jeremy, I suppose, never followed a bus in a 20 limit but kept to it. Any thoughts of when the majority of the bus fleet, say in London, will have uh, ISA? Roger, I just think that's such a good point. And I, I keep looking at the buses and thinking, I'm not sure that's doing, they, you know, we're that 900 out of whatever, 700 out of 9,000, what's that, 6% or something like that. I'd like to know what the numbers are. And, and I think the fleet's supposed to be replaced every seven years or so. But yeah, I'd like to see a lot more of it. And I will ask TFL that question. It's a really good point. Yeah, I mean, there, there are issues about bus safety, you know, you might look at Tom Carney and Michael Libris stuff about bus safety and uh, uh, you know you, you uh, whether it be the health and uh, questions of fatigue about bus drivers uh, or way they behave with regard to cyclists I mean we should be doing a lot better with bus safety I mean not from attacking people but being on side with uh, bus drivers um, Claire, you're, someone's asked you how they can get in contact with you directly. What's your email again? Um, shall I put it in the chat? Yes, please. Uh, I think we should really be drawing to a close as we've gone a bit over time. Uh, can I just say thanks to Jenny Jones, who's had to do some House of Lords stuff. Uh, thanks to our sponsors uh, who've helped out. That's Next Base, Dash Cams, uh, Madison and Cyclic for Cyclic Camera Lights, and more Barlow. Um, what I personally like to say, I'd like to thank Jeremy and Claire, uh, who are unsung heroes. A large part of the work they've done has been unpaid. Uh, very important work. Uh, thank our colleagues Road Peace for having put this on this uh, series of webinars. We had had wanted to do this in April, but COVID and everything, and more to come. All these things come together: cultural change, reduction in motor vehicle usage, reducing danger at source. Um, do send any specific questions in future to me at chairrdrf at aol.com. Uh, there's the Road Danger Reduction Forum website, the Road Peace website. Um, I'd also like to refer people to the weekly webinar, Ideas with Beers. You can get onto that by emailing Brian Deegan at ideaswithbeers at gmail.com. We're on for an hour and a half every Tuesday at 5 p.m. And uh, we do hope to keep in touch with people. So thanks very much, everybody. Victoria, do you want to say anything? Yes, everyone, thank you so much. I just put this in the chat, but one um, quick thing is that I should say that with the PCC uh, manifesto, we will be reaching out to the walking and cycling groups. Uh, so watch the space on that one. Okay, thanks everyone. Thanks so much to, we had 90 people at, uh, at the top. Thanks for attending. Thanks so much for uh, joining this webinar. Goodbye everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.